Chapter 12. We're in the fourth section of this book. There are seven in all. If it is taken as a chiasm, we're in the central element, which should be the most important. Another structural element in this apocalypse is that it has been going back and forth between a spiritual concept followed by how it plays out in our lives in history. First a symbolic vision of Jesus, and then how he is sufficient and willing to meet the needs of seven churches. Then a God's eye view of the redeemed creation, and seven pictures of how the church enters into the Lamb's redemptive work to move it on its way. Third, the church is marked for protection against seven trumpets of judgment, by which God has restrained evil in the world. The section we are in begins with John's commissioning for his apostolic role in proclaiming the gospel, chapter 10, and a parallel vision of the church called to participate in that same work, chapter 11. Let me parenthetically say that there is a study guide that goes along with these PowerPoints that contains a lot of details that we've just skipped over. The talks are just designed to hit main ideas as to what an omnil approach might look like. If you want that handout, just let the church office know, or me, and we'll, we can email a zip file to you, but beware, it's about 60 pages. Today, we begin the seven-part expression of how this concept of the church's witness plays out. It goes on for three chapters. Here's how Greg Beale outlines it. Number one, the conflict of the serpent with the woman and her seed. Chapter 12. 12.1, 12, and a great sign was seen in the heavens. A woman having been clothed with the sun and the moon was underneath her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Number two, persecution by beasts from the sea. 13, 1 to 10. And I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten diadems, and on its heads names of blasphemy. Number three, persecution by the beast from the land. And I saw another beast coming up from the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, but spoke like a dragon. Number four, the Lamb and the 144,000 on Mount Zion. And I saw, and behold, the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 with the name of his Father having been written on their foreheads. This would be the central element of this chiasm. Number five, the proclamation of the gospel and the judgment by three angels. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an everlasting gospel to proclaim to those dwelling on the earth, even to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. Number six then, the son of man's harvest of the earth. And I saw, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud one sitting like the son of man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hands a sharp sickle. Then there's an interlude, 15.1. Announcement of the completion of God's wrath. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the last seven plagues, because the anger of God was completed in them. And then number seven, the saints' victory over the beast and their victory song. And I saw, as it were, a glassy sea having been mixed with fire, and the ones overcoming the beast, and its image, and its mark, and the number of its name, standing on the glassy sea, having harps of God. Each of these sections is a vision, typically introduced by, and I saw. Let's hear about the first. Revelation 12. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. 
She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Note that this is a sign, actually two. It isn't literal, but it is true. Where in the Bible do we have a similar celestial woman? How about Joseph's dream in Genesis? Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaths gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. Who were the sun, moon, and eleven stars? His family, his father Jacob, his mother Rachel, and brothers, all of which became Israel. But how about in this eschatological version, who is the woman? Two main contenders might be number one, Mary, or number two, Israel. How about the child? Isaiah 54 to 66 contains several long passages which refers to Israel as God's child. Even so, it's pretty obvious that the progeny here is more specifically Jesus. Little here is said about him except his being called up to God's throne. But that's enough. This whole book is focused on him. But this section has to do with the commissioning of John and the church for what we've called the gospel battle for the world. Unless one has strong Catholic leanings, one would not likely hold on to the notion of Mary very long when we read that she and her other children are airlifted into the desert to protect them from the dragon. In this book, two main women are featured, one a bride, the other a harlot. Which one symbolizes God's people? I'll leave that to you. In the Old Testament, God's people were Israel. In the New Testament, she consists of people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation the church. It's us. Who or what then is the serpent or the dragon? Notice he too has a celestial component simil similar to the woman. Where do these visions represent? Both in heaven and on earth. They seem to alternate. The one seems to affect the other. To make things even more difficult, one might see a vision in heaven that represents something earthly. But we'll try to sort it out. Why is the woman dressed as she is? What do you think it means? Psalm 8 To the choir master, according to the Giddeth, a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth! You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. In the creation account, dominion over the created order was given to humanity as God's image bearers. This includes the celestial bodies. They are a sign of the dignity we were given in creation to rule under God, even over angelic beings. Angels were made to serve and assist us, who were mere babes and infants, yet exercising God's strength. When God indwells us by His Spirit, we become a life form fit to be His bride. How great was our fall! In it we lost more than some spiritual capacity or status. We lost God. How can we get this all back? 
Hebrews 2.6, it has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we do see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It is through Jesus that mankind is restored. Recall Daniel 7, the Son of Man prophecy, in which political kingdoms are judged and their dominion is given to the Son and the saints of the Most High. We were created to rule with God but we traded it all away for something we thought that would be better. Rather than trusting God, we trusted ourselves. We made deals with things in the created order, but they enslaved us. Professing to be wise, we became suckers and worshiped and served our own creations rather than our creator who is blessed forever. But the institutions we invented, those we thought that would be better or safer than having to trust God, like Frankenstein's monster, turned against their makers. But one has come to restore the created order to its original design. How? He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He trusted his father, something we declined to do. It cost him dearly. But because he did, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And now we too can share his rule. But now in our rebellion we were not alone. We joined a mutiny in progress, one that began in heaven, and this too turned on us. That's what chapter 12 is about. Its first sections have both heavenly and earthly components, but it's mostly, mostly an earthly perspective. The heavenly viewpoint is what we get next. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nursed for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. This war is fought neither with nuclear nor mainly with conventional weapons or power of any Newtonian sort no war that means anything ever is. This is a war of words, truth, integrity, courage, and righteousness. 
To see it from another perspective, let's look at Zechariah 3. Zechariah 3. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by, and the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are assigned. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. So here's the heavenly battle. What's it all about? It takes place in God's courtroom. The defendant is Joshua, high priest of Israel at the time. Defense attorney is the angel of the Lord. The prosecutor, the Satan, meaning accuser. So what about it? Is Joshua guilty? Of course, just look at how he's dressed. What was the most important role entrusted to the high priest? On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, he would bring sacrificial blood into the Holy of Holies to make atonement for the people for all their sin from the preceding year. It gave them a fresh start. On that day, the Kohen Gadol wore five sets of garments, three golden and two white linen, immersed in the mikvah bath five times. He washed his hands and feet ten times. Sacrifices included two lambs, one bull, two goats, and two rams, with accompanying meal offerings, wine libations, and three incense offerings. He would enter the Holy of Holies three times during the day's events. Why all these washings? The first bull offered was for the high priest's own sin. He had to be utterly pure, even before he could make atonement for his people, clean enough to enter but momentarily God's presence. But in Zechariah 3 he is filthy. The language suggests covered with excrement. He was wholly unable to do what his people needed him to. Can you see Satan standing there holding his nose, uttering charge after charge, laughing in derision at this so-called high priest? He has no defense. It's a slam dunk. Until something happens, something unexpected. God commands that his rags be exchanged for new clothes and a dazzling big hat. At this, it is the devil's case that is thrown out of court. He has no legal leg or legs, get it, to stand on and is therefore thrown down to the earth to now crawl on his belly, so to speak. No longer able to prosecute the church in heaven, he can now only persecute them on earth. And this he does with all the humiliated vengeance he can. He knows his time is short. Here's the Lucan version. Luke 10, and you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. And then talking to the disciples, Jesus sent out to witness. The one who hears you, hears me. And the one who rejects you, rejects me. And the one who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, 
and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Isaiah is a rich source from which garment imagery seems to come. Isaiah 61.10 I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God. Why? For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Why all this garment imagery? It communicates. It displays something. Who and what Jesus is in scene one. Who Joshua is, filthy, in, in this scene. It communicates. And it's a good way to express salvation by imputation, isn't it? We become dressed in Jesus' righteousness, his status. It covers our sin. We become simul justus et peccator, sinful yet justified. But our salvation also routes out our sin, slowly but inevitably. The woman's celestial clothing communicates what? It identifies her as Israel, Joseph's family, right? Joshua as high priest represents Israel, and Israel is God's people. In the New Testament, Israel is fulfilled in the church. God's people now are from everywhere. Restored humanity. Why celestial imagery? Humanity was made to rule the cosmos under God. Psalm 8. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him? Yet we were given rule over everything, even the celestial realm. Recall the Bible is geocentric, not spatially, but, but the center of its story, its meaning, its purpose. We don't yet see this, but we do see Jesus, Hebrews, who now rules in fact and we with him. The central theme of the created order is salvation of fallen humanity. Satan and company try to stop it, but Jesus prevails. From one perspective, this is seen as a war in heaven, and from another viewpoint, it's a trial. But they're both the same thing, just different perspectives, right? Now one final detail, the downfall of Satan as depicted prophetically by Isaiah and Ezekiel in the Old Testament. We've already looked at it from Luke's perspective. You have become like us. Your pomp is brought down to Sheol. The sound of your harps, maggots are laid as a bed beneath you, and worms are your covers. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn, how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. Is this the man who made the earth tremble? Who shook kingdoms? Who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities? Who did not let his prisoners go home? And then from Ezekiel 28. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, emerald and carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You, 
were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. So in this portion of the Central Seven, characterized by And I Saw, we have established that the ce celestial war in heaven that Revelation summarizes was a legal battle over the salvation of fallen humanity. In it, Satan the dragon is defeated by Jesus, whose righteousness was given to God's people to cover their sin. This restores God's people to the place of rule for which they were designed, not only covered by Jesus, but also filled by his spirit. On the other hand, Satan having no legal basis against us must turn from prosecution to persecution, the only thing he has left. And so we can surmise that will be the nature of what he tries to do as depicted in the next visions we encounter. How does he persecute the church and how can the church overcome it?